that I fisted so they could scissor. Hey, RJ, how are you, Farsley? Good. I think I'm okay. I haven't thought about it yet. It's still early enough in the morning that my day can go either way. So I don't want to set up too many expectations and be disappointed, you know? Yeah. I always like to think something horrible may happen. Maybe I'll ask you again at the end of the interview and see if it's if it's changed. <laughs> Great idea. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I hope you have not set any expectations either for this. No, I like to set my expectations low. Just I don't want to be disappointed. Right. Well, this is what I'm learning. Even setting them low sometimes, you just don't set them. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to You walk into the world like this and say, I'm open to receive you. <laughs> That's what I've learned. <laughs> that is a good tip. I'm, I'm open to receive anything, yes. Good. Let's receive. <laughs> well... What I've been receiving recently. Is, Good segue. Is a Hey UW. So I wanted to ask you about that first. Um, yes. We adore it. And I think what's so great is like, you never know what you're going to get with each guest and how they take it and react to it like as a viewer. So for you, what is your kind of prep like? Because you come in with what looks like a full document like dossier on on each person and you get some crazy facts to ask them about like, you know previous hats that they've worn in the beginning of their careers and stuff and like yes uh, so what is the prep like for you well i guess it depends on the person some people some things will pop into my head like i have right now probably 20 or 25 interviews relatively completely written already because mm -hmm. i never really know who i'm going to get until I get there that week and some people can do it and some people can't schedule and it's whatever. So I already always have like a couple uh, in my back pocket, but sometimes things will just come to me and I will start writing and it's like, oh, there's something good there. And then other times I will go, I don't really know much about this person. So I need to research them and then I will find things. And then a lot, probably what, what you see in an interview is maybe a third of what I have written. And then I've taken things out that I don't like, like literally up until like when they're getting mic'd up, I'm crossing out things. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that's the process. Um, but there's some people like Chris Jericho, who I had started writing, because obviously like I'm familiar with the man's career. Yeah, I was a, a large fan growing up. So I had things on the top of my head. I had, I had written for like months and months and months and then never scheduled it. And then he was like, when am I gonna do the show? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, okay, I'll get something ready. And then there are other people like Soraya who she came in and I was like, well, we have to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Wikipedia is a useful resource most of the time. And then when they don't have big Wikipedias, I have to go to cagematch.net. Yeah. Which, th I mean, thank God for that. They have every obscure, odd thing that people have ever done. And then other times I will speak to close friends or family members uh, to see if there's any pertinent dirt on the people. So at least like, and I think that's what helps people not get too mad at me, is that I come from a somewhat legitimate place with the questions. You um, sometimes provide a good gateway into other things. Like if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have lost a day to watching every episode of Downfall that I could find. So, and that makes me happy is that yeah. people some, somehow can get some sort of knowledge out mm -hmm. of the show. I was a big Downfall fan. I thought this can't miss. And then you go, you go watch it and it's before it's time. Yeah. Because all YouTube is, all TikTok is, is, is things falling off buildings now. Yeah. So why it wasn't a hit? Well, it was too expensive. The, it, that was back when game shows always had like those shiny black floors. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much money they spent on wax. It wasn't necessary. No one was into them. And yeah, it's one of those, those weird things. Downfall. Let's reboot it. I'll reboot Downfall. Oh. Um, but yes, I'm so happy that somehow people can learn stuff. And also I loved 
reading comments on like the Arn Anderson episode going, I am i don't know his stuff because it was before I was born, but he's very funny. I'm going to look up his stuff. Then I feel like I'm doing a public service, you know, where I could be like, this person is amazing. Yeah. Like, obviously, you know, what we're doing is, is different, but I always feel like interviewing uh, in wrestling like if you're an interviewer or a, a journalist and you're not doing it in wrestling like you don't know how how weird it is to be wrestling interviewing because you never like for me I never know what I'm going to get with someone whether they're like going to be like fully in character kayfabe or whether they're going to like be themselves it's just something that like other people don't experience like you don't you know yes or you know often in my case both at the same time yeah um, I was just talking about this, that I'm happy to, obviously, I like to, you know, poke people. It's one of my favorite things to do. But with someone like Willow, for example, who you see on TV, and you go, okay, the gimmick is that she's very happy and very positive. And then I'm able to push back on it for basically 10 minutes. And you realize, oh, it's not just a gimmick. Mm -hmm. Like, this is who this person is. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like with how do you kind of gauge with someone how far you can take something because like on new year's day i nearly like spat out my coffee when you mentioned big show wearing leather pants to a funeral to his dad's funeral yes um <laughs> it's it's strange i have a lot of stuff that i i write down a question because it's just personal to me at first right yeah. i don't have a writing team no one really looks at my scripts or gives me out so the first thing I write down is, is I will let myself guide me. What I think is funny, what I think is interesting. Sometimes I go, oh, is this off color? Will this upset the person? Yeah. Will it not come off too well? And then I just make that call in the moment. And so far, I don't think I've backed off on anything. Just because I'm in the moment and they're in the moment and they're trusting of me, it's really up to them. Like, you should really just interview them and say, how did you let this person <laughs> ask you these questions? And with Paul White, you know, they don't see any of the questions before we film. They get mic'd up and then we roll. Mm -hmm. I don't clear anything with anybody. So what you're seeing for the most part is their real unedited reaction, which makes me happy. Yeah, I think um, the best thing is like sometimes you can kind of see the moment where it clicks with them, like what's going on, like an hour and a half yes. or something. Like I felt like when you did the one with with Jericho, when you opened it by saying like I knew it was you and the Masked Singer, I just felt there was something there where like it like clicked of what this was gonna be like for him. Yes, yeah, that's also the weird thing is that and Matt Hardy for some reason thought it was going to be an actual interview mm -hmm. and i thought no you've spoken to me multiple times before over the years like you should know this but you know a lot of people either have not seen the show or they've only seen clips and they don't understand like i guess what it's like and we always say like people figure it out like halfway through yeah you yeah. know where they go oh all of this is gonna be ridiculous okay yeah. fine do you prefer someone that knows it or do you prefer like the challenge of, of someone that well, is familiar? It's different now because we've done almost 50 episodes. So people will know it, mm -hmm. you know, like we're over the hump of like, I, I don't think Jim Ross knew that I, I worked with the guy. He was like, what is it? It was still very early on and he was just sweet yeah. enough to show up. Arn Anderson certainly didn't know because we didn't have that many episodes out. Uh, but by this point, we've done enough of them. And they're like, you know, people will come up all the time. They're like, I just watched 10 of them. I just watched a bunch of them. And you're like, oh, my God. And then you're like, well, how do I, you know, surprise this person? Or how can I take this person further? And I think topically, I think we probably evolve somewhat, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it is good when people are already open yeah. Although, although I do like when people get uncomfortable. So I keep constantly trying to find new ways to make people uncomfortable. One of the most unexpected things I saw was you reenacting a scene from Carnation Street with William Regal. Yes. Um, obviously, I'm from the UK. 
Yes. Did not expect to see you do a Deirdre Barlow on uh, on AEW's YouTube channel. Show. <laughs> or. <laughs> I'm from Canada. Hmm. And we always, you know, Canada is like this odd, like adopted stepchild of England. And it's something we can't get away from. And the queen is still on the money. And it's a whole thing. They will always, always, since I was a kid, like Saturday and Sunday mornings, like Coronation Street was like on. It was always like this. So I always, you know, knew about it. And there was that season when they ran out of stories and they just made a train fall. That was the whole thing. Um, So that was always in the back of my head. And then I knew he knew about it. He was a very big fan of it. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, what what can we do that fits? So I sat through a lot of Coronation Street to find a scene that was, I think, appropriate for both of us to do. Mm -hmm. And I, what I also love is that, like, again, something I did not discuss with him. You like Coronation Street? Yes, I do. Well, let's do this. And then he's just willing to do it, you know? He jumps right in, which is just great and then we infiltrated the coronation street demo it's uh people like are tweeting other british people going you really need to see this (laughs) which is great and and you know where else can that happen i guess where else can you hear william regal uh recite coronation street although i'm sure he probably does privately in his own home but yeah it was just it was like so um unexpected like I used to watch a lot of uh, Corey I haven't watched it in a while we have another soap I don't know if you get it in Canada um Everdale where they recently did a really bad wrestler storyline oh it. I don't know about this but I will be investigating this oh, uh, when we get off this interview this will be yeah. the first thing I google yeah it's like a, I don't um, I don't know if you know this I don't mm-hmm. know how far your research extends on me but I was on a BBC program uh-huh uh, for children mm-hmm. called splat a lot um okay. and it was hosted by dick and dom oh from in the bungalow yes <laughs> and they came to toronto twice and we did stuff together too so they were like kind of my gateway mm-hmm. into england which is very sweet so i know a little it is weird i i always try to be i don't know sometimes i i don't worry but i'm like if i go too broad like so I write stuff, and then there, if there's stuff I'm worried about, I have a small focus group of friends yeah. who I can call and say, is this offensive? <laughs> or does anyone even know what I'm talking about? And that has not deterred me. Yeah. You know, if I had to do something for everyone to understand, then it wouldn't be that exciting for you. Mm-hmm. If I had to worry about a guy in Nantucket, then I wouldn't be doing the Coronation Street thing. And then you wouldn't enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. So... I try to be as, but then I'm broad enough. Like we talk about Nickelodeon stuff and I'm sure we talk about a bunch of stuff that British people don't get. So I think ultimately it evens out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've also introduced me to some uh, Nickelodeon stuff that I went back and watched too (laughs) as well. Yes, there's wonderful episodes of Chris Jericho on Figure It Out and Paxar Jim Duggan and Brian Knobs, Mm -hmm. uh, which is quite a handful. Have you ever watched, uh, now I'm just getting into wrestlers on UK TV, but another oh, thing to Google, if you haven't seen it, is um, a show we used to have called The Big Breakfast. Yes. Uh, have you seen um, Randy Savage on that? Yes. And he does a thing with, Lily with a Savage. kid. Yes. But isn't there a kid who calls in? Um, yeah, he was on it. I think he was on it twice. but. Yeah. That I used to watch um, before I went to school in the in the morning, and I was at the time a WCW fan. And the morning that Randy Savage popped on it, I couldn't believe it. And then he gets interviewed, like by drag queen Lily Savage, um, where she's just like says to him, "Are we married?" and stuff like that. And I was just watching this like this was a major world's collide moment. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. Absolutely. There's, it's so weird. British television is structured so much differently and that's what I love about it though. Yeah. It's so uh, cool. Yes. Uh, what do you like, do you usually do the guests like speak to you afterwards or are you just like in and out with them? <laughs> uh, I'm kind of in and out. So we, sh- usually when I come in, we shoot like four in a row because I would shoot them often on show days. So I don't want to bother people too much. Like they probably have matches that night and you know, you got, they have more important things to do. So really when we do 
they come in, they get mic'd up and I'm like, do you have any questions? And they usually don't. And then we roll and what you see is basically what you get. And then we stop. And basically as they're leaving, the next person is coming in, mm. which is emotionally difficult for me because I sometimes need the closure yeah. of, was this okay? Yeah, I get that. Was everything fine? Like I really need, even when I tape anything, I'm always, I, I feel horrible when I, I film any episode. Once we're done, I'm going to the camera person, was that fine? Mm -hmm. And they just need to look at me and go, yes, that was okay. And then I will calm down. Yeah. But, you know, there's some people where I'm like, gee, I wish I could have asked if they were okay afterwards. I mean, I say thank you and that was fun and everyone so far has been nice to me. But, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to, as much as I want to bother people, I don't want to bother them, you know, long term. Yeah. I don't want to bother them in a way that has any ill effects for me. Let me put it that way. <laughs> but you said that you like haven't got any notes. So does it go <laughs> go through like a producing thing or like is Tony watching every episode to make sure it's up to standard I, or? <laughs> I will say this, my general understanding and you know, Tony is directly the reason that I'm in AEW because yeah. he messaged me and he was like, hey, let's, he had known my stuff, the the stuff I did in WWE. I did like a comedy special and he knew that, but he knew all the, the videos I put online, just stupid videos I was making, which blew me away. Cause it's like, why didn't you tell me earlier? Um, so I think he knew exactly what he was getting. He was also my second guest, which yeah. was pretty much the stamp of approval of like, I tolerate this person's idiocy, you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess my, my direct boss, would be Kevin Sullivan, not the wrestler. Mm -hmm. uh, the editor did a bunch of stuff in Impact, did a bunch of Attitude Era stuff. He did the Rock Chef Boyardee commercial mm -hmm. and all those weird like Super Soccer commercials, which I ask about constantly. Uh, so he he would essentially be my boss and, and, and he would have the final say on what goes and what stays. There's mm -hmm. really rarely a debate. The only stuff we've had to cut out are things that don't make sense because by the time it comes out, things are different. So yeah. maybe somebody's lost a title or somebody's whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, e sorry, this is, can I be disgusting on this? Can I say something off color or no? Oh, are you sure? Of course, yes. Okay, you're, you don't have anyone to clear this with? I have no censors for- uh, So my oh, third yeah. episode was Eddie Kingston mm -hmm. and they made a horrible, horrible, fisting joke at the end okay and you know i hope you spin back here and fist me again that's what <laughs> i said okay and i thought and especially when you when you traffic in those kind of things you mm -hmm. just have to expect getting a phone call saying we can't say that you know this is my first day on the job by the way so i you know i just go yeah, i'm gonna swing and if it's a problem we'll deal with it when it's a problem and i thought you know, once they see this, I'm going to get a call. <laughs> I didn't get a call. And I was shocked. I wanted to call them back and say, no one has a problem with this. Are you <laughs> sure? <laughs> yeah. And it is, it is funny what's allowable and, and what's not and, and what we have to censor and, and what's not. But I think they've been incredibly lenient with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the now prominence of scissoring being spoken about on television every right. yeah <laughs> that must yeah. be some relief on how far you can yes we take things <laughs> yes i think i would it's safe to say that i fisted so they could scissor <laughs> i think that would be very fair that will be the head i mean also you know luckily we're we're, we're on youtube and it's aw's youtube so i think within reason we have perhaps a little more leniency yeah especially with live television, you know, I mean, ask Rick Ross, things go awry, awry constantly. So, but also that's wrestling. I, I, what are you expecting? Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, you're not gonna have somebody come out there recreation street. That makes no sense. <laughs> so when Tony, uh, so he DM slide at you, he slid into your DMs. He's, so. Tony Khan slid into my DMs. And I believe that should be the headline when the dirt sheets pick this one up. <laughs> But like, did he did he slide in with ideas or was it just you know the I I had tweeted 
a uh, so I was working for WWE for like a year and a half, and then during one of the mass rounds of cuts, hmm. not only was I gone, it was it was very weird, but like you know the my, the whole department kind of changed. So we were like, oh my god, and I thought, well, I did that. That's it. Let's go work on some TV shows and maybe work on some wrestling stuff. This is still kind of the middle of the pandemic. We're just getting out of it. And it's, you know, it's not like I can start wrestling everywhere. So I was just working on videos and I had flippantly tweeted out one of my previous failed pitches where I would drive wrestlers on the, on the road to the, the show. And for some reason, it was a very popular tweet. And then he messaged me and he's like, are you, you know, done with WWE? Like, let's do this. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, are you sure? And then he said, yes. And like, let's do sit down interviews too, which I had done a bunch before, like on my own YouTube and different things, but not, not to the level that it, I think deserved to be done with mm -hmm. AEW. And then he just gave the green light to it and then put me in touch with Kevin, who I was friendly with before. And he knew my work and Sanjay, who has been pulling for me to work at a variety of wrestling promotions for like over a decade now, which is so incredibly sweet. And then we're so happy that when we finally get to work together, it's this. Yeah. You know, I hate to, I don't want to be like those, everything happens for a reason and blah, blah, blah. But like, this was worth the wait, I think, for all of us. So with them, the hey w like pitch origin where you just you guys just decided that you would do a sit down thing but you didn't necessarily pitch it as the kind of odd interview style that it is well i think it was in my vein of humor and tony is very smart number one comedically like he can yeah. speak that comedy like i said it'll be a little bit like this and a little bit like this and it was like oh okay and then he also knew what he was getting with me. So I feel like, and it is weird, both WWE and NAW, I had positions that only seemed to be created for me where they're like, here you go, uh, do whatever you want. There's whatever weird things you do, knock yourself out. So I think he knew what, generally speaking, what he was getting into. And I had drawn up a pitch and the way the show looks and the way it's structured is really just because of the resources we have, uh, depending on a show day and whatever, like there's only so much set. Obviously we're in like a storage closet in an arena or a hotel conference room. And the set was built to be portable. The sign is on wheels. The on-air sign I have, because I thought I would have to be, you know, sneaking into locker rooms or mm -hmm. ambushing people as they came out of the bathroom. So we have all these little things like that. And I wrote up a whole pitch and like a brainstorming sheet and I had a big list of titles. And sometimes when you write, you just go, I'm not even going to worry about if it's good first. I'm just going to write and whatever ideas come or what come. And the first idea of a title was Hey W. And it was probably the stupidest idea I could think of, you know, or you just, whatever, just put something there. And then we got on a conference call and, Kevin said, I think we all agree. The title has to be Hey W. <laughs> and I go, gee, okay, good luck, guys. And then, you know, the graphic came where it was, you know, me writing a Sharpie on a big sign and it, it looks like, hey, ooh. And I was like, okay, I think we have something here, which is, you know, utter immature chaos and confusion. And how, so how do you kind of see things going like obviously you're doing this now but what is your like is your goal to take it to like the main show or to do like your piper a piper's pit style thing or or what can you yeah, say that has been certainly thrown out there as an option mm -hmm. it's not a goal because yeah. i don't then i feel like i'm just using my show to get somewhere and then i feel like it's not fair to the show like i want the show to be the show and i want as many people on it as possible. And I want as many people to see it as possible. You know, I want that, the thing I'm doing to be as big as possible. Yeah. Um, there's so much more of the roster we have to get through. Uh, so much more. And then we can have celebrities. Please give me Bow Wow. If this company does anything with Bow Wow, please let me end him on this show. It's totally fine by me.
I want. Um, I did want to ask you if you feel responsibility for what has yes, happened to Cargill. With I I feel responsible for Bow Wow, and I, on behalf of just myself, I want to apologize to all the fans of AW, all the staff, and everyone at Warner. That was really Pandora's box, and I opened it like a fool. And I just, I have tremendous regret and I aim to rectify it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is one of those things where it's like, oh my God, we could easily do a live episode of this. Yeah. So I, and, and people have said it before, but it's one of those things that would have to line up right. You just want to, you don't want to throw it out there like every wrestling talk show ever where yeah. it's two people yelling, set gets destroyed. And then I'm like, Meh. like we created something, you know, unique here. And mm. I think everyone um respects that in the sense that they would only do that if it really did make sense you know yeah. um what else i'm i'm working on a variety of other ideas with them in addition to that so my first thing is always like let's focus on the show people like the show people watch the show let's get more people on it more people watching it and just keep that going and then there's other stuff within the the aw you know thing um, people throw out ideas with me and Renee all the time because I think people really enjoy co-hosts who don't like each other. Yeah. That seems to be an appealing dynamic for people like Regis and Kathy Lee. So, and there's there's plenty of things we could do in that form too. So m more will come. Who for sure. that hasn't been on is the person that you think would make like the most bizarre best guest. I have been asking for John Moxley for a number of, he's probably one of the first interviews I actually wrote. Mm -hmm. John Moxley. Wouldn't he be easy with, with Renee? Have you asked? She's not an easy person, you know, and I, and perhaps she's withholding it. Look, I think it's pretty clear that he's his own person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's a person who doesn't say yes, dear, it's probably him. <laughs> uh, who else? Obviously, this you know MJF, Stokely yes. Hathaway, um, Cheetah. I would like Takesha. I would like the Young Bucks, Kenny. And now I'm just listing a bunch of people. Yeah. The Dark Order, Hangman Adam Page, and then and that's the best thing about the AEW roster, where I go, oh my god, Jake Roberts is here. Yeah, how did you? Oh, I got to do a Jake Roberts one and Justin Rhodes. All of that would be fantastic. And then Rick Ross. Oh my god. Yes. What it's you know, gee. And then and then of course Bow Wow. And and AW is also this this great place where you could easily have, unfortunately, a David Arquette come on or a Mario Cantone from Sex in the City. I, I think that is the the beauty of this. So who knows where it will and then you know, these people who want to come on again already. Mm -hmm. So we've almost done. 50 episodes, and I believe the week after Revolution is the one year anniversary. Wow. Yeah, I, I would, know. I'd like to see Sting twice yes. with one with makeup and one without makeup. Okay. Uh, two yes. Different episodes. Like it's two that would be fantastic. I would also love uh, Captain Insano. I think he yes. would be a wonderful guest. Uh, Broken Matt Hardy. Mm -hmm. I think is just a completely different human being. Uh, negative one, I would like to sit with and do a, a very deep conversation. So, and I also want to see them play. I want, I want them to be released on VHS. I think that would make me happiness. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> um, how is it? Uh, so you've said that you, you know, worked with WWE, and that's where a lot of people first first saw you. Like, how how different is, is that to AEW? How did you feel in that situation? Um, it, it was similar in a sense where they they let my sensibilities guide me, but there were a lot more restrictions mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what we could and couldn't do, and there was just it was like getting sucked up in a tornado yeah and a bunch of stuff was happening and then a bunch of stuff they would plan just wouldn't happen for a million other reasons it was like a city where yeah. like you know you want to get your driver's license renewed you have to talk to 40 people yeah. and you're like well this will just never get done so there's a bunch of stuff there that i had worked on 
and for whatever reason didn't happen and like that drives me insane because you you get emotionally attached to these things yeah and you can't bring them out um one example is a segment called is on here the giant hot which i now often ask people on <laughs> aw because I, I it's in my system it needs to come out and then aw is the right amount of how can we have enough people and resources to make stuff happen without getting in our own way? The yeah. crew is very, and I don't mean this as an insult. I mean it as a compliment. It's like bare minimum to make sure it gets done, which is the best. They're focused on making stuff. Sometimes a company is too big that they have the luxury to work on stuff that will never happen. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, that bothers me. I don't like being holed up with all these ideas and then I can't show them. That's not fun. So yeah, it's it's much better in terms of getting the work out there. And regularly, I, I mean, I've done stuff for like literally 50 weeks in a row. Like we've put out, and any pay-per-view week where we don't have Hey W, we've done the car stuff or we've done a red carpet. So every single week we've put out new stuff, which is for me, great makes me feel normal you know did it feel like um so he, in AEW, like with tony does it feel more direct like right when you were in wwe did you feel like you were working for like i'm working for vince mcmahon's WWE? no i'm on the night. no uh nobody slid into my dms no. <laughs> um it did feel like we were on this island and that's the the drawback of the company being so big yeah we're like is anyone even watching this and here i mean i have my own basically day and time slot like sunday mornings is is this on their channel and on their stuff which is amazing and then we have total access where if i need to speak to tony mm -hmm. I, I i mean i don't i try not to because i feel like he's got a bunch of things to do he's you know football and things of that nature but you can literally go knock on his door and and talk to him and which is the best and if i need to talk to anyone they're there and accessible and that's the best part and i think that's i, I don't think i could have gotten this level of intimacy with the wrestlers anywhere else mm -hmm. which yeah. is which is what i think why the show works because it is smaller and it's people people feeling other people's energies i think it's basically yeah. the show but you did get kind of intimacy when you were in your pants in front of Steve Austin. How, how did that come about? <laughs> so David Arquette and I did Steve Austin's podcast, mm -hmm. which I believe is no longer available online. I think he, they took his whole podcast down that he had on his own. But so we sat in his studio where he does Broken Skull and we brought him a cherry pie which he was mad about, but he ate. And then afterwards, and I will say, Steve Austin is a fantastic interviewer and mm -hmm. did research and like took it seriously yeah. in a way that I did not expect. And so afterwards, we were all talking for like an hour. We're having a great time. And then I said, look, I'm going to ask you a question and feel free to tell me to go fuck myself, which is always my out, I think, when I ask people things. And he knew what I was talking about. And he said, all right, let's just go do it behind the bar. And stupidly, for some reason, well, David Arquette is the one who is filming that episode of me in my underwear with Steve Austin, which is on my YouTube. And that was- Behind the camera, David? David is the one filming it, yeah. And why I didn't think, gee, we'll use him too. <laughs> He's not, I hit the novelty of David has worn off on me. So, um, yeah, it was great. And that's one of those things where you're just like, you know, I got to be in my underwear next to Steve Austin. Why not follow this path? Maybe my life is leading me in the right direction. <laughs> and it is the only show that I know of that has had both Steve Austin and Mario Cantone on as guests. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, I don't know if I'm doing something right, but I'm certainly doing something. <laughs> Well, you've mentioned David Arquette there a few times. And yeah. last, no, it was 2020, I interviewed uh, David Arquette when he oh, my apologies. was coming out. And I wanted to, to read you a quote from David. Great. Is it 
did somebody proofread it or is it just rambling and has no grammar? Does it involve giggling? So I asked him the very original question of would you go to WWE or AW? And David's answer was, if I were to do anything else, I'd always want to do it with RJ because we had a great tag team dynamic together and all the sorts of trouble I got into was typically when I was on my own. He knows how to sort of navigate the waters better than me. So I'm wondering, why, why don't you have the same loyalty to David? I don't see him on AW or WWE. Because he has not helped me navigate anything. If anything, he's, he- you know, he's held me down. And he is a man who says yes first and he figures it out as he goes. Yeah. I think when I brought his name up at WWE, I was maybe met with a... <laughs> Which whatever is is his bed and he has to lie in it. I think he was a guest host of Raw once and it did not go so well. In AEW, you know, he's appeared on BTE before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they had talked about doing something with him even before I got there. He often has a habit of you fumbling the bag, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Having said that, he did do such a great thing by having us all on Celebrity Family Feud. Me, Jungle Boy, Peter Avalon, Dalton Castle. And now we've all appeared for AEW except for him. <laughs> so in terms of support, he has it. Uh, in terms of capability, that's entirely on him. But anytime he would like to come on, on AEW, I will pull some strings. Mm-hmm. Because that's... What a sweet thing to say for I'm someone bad. who... You know, having said that, I did, you know, try to go out of my way to make sure he didn't die. And then without me, he came close quite a few times. Um, How did you, how did you meet him? And like, were you, were you an Arquette fan? Um, (laughs) So I was probably a fan of the rest of his family. Mm -hmm. His, his father was an actor and his grandfather was a famous comedian on the radio and he was on Hollywood Squares. I was more familiar with that stuff than with peak 90s David Arquette. Uh, I mean, I had seen C-Spot run, but I I, I had met him basically on Twitter. We had a friend named Ben Joseph who, he was David's old writing partner. He lives in Toronto. He's a wrestling fan. He would come to indie shows I was doing. And David was looking to get back into the business for the documentary. And Ben said, if you want to, you should hook up with this guy. Mm-hmm. So we started tweeting each other and then it blew up into this weirdness. I think that's also what helps us communicate is that he is an old show business, like four generations of his family are in show business. Yeah. So he knows that old Hollywood stuff. And I think that's how we connected. And that's what made our relationship easier. Yeah. That's um, like, I love that you loved his, the generations before him, rather than him. Like, um, because you have, like, I was going to talk about this later, but you, I love that you use old Hollywood references. I never thought I'd hear Ethel Merman in, mentioned in wrestling. And I'm really into old movies and like uh, golden age of Hollywood stuff. And it's just, it reminds me like when I was a teenager, like, cause my favorite actor is John Barrymore. So Drew's grandpa, oh, yes. I'm like obsessed with him. And when I was a teenager, um, I was like m- messaging his grandson on like MySpace, who just had a policy of like, if, if you want, if you have any like interest in Drew, I'm not talking to you, but <laughs> anything else is like fine. And I was like a kid, like, uh, I, I don't like, no offense to Drew, but like, I don't care. Can you please tell me about your grandfather? <laughs> Like, yes, who, I mean, all respect to Drew, yeah. you know, had the more significant career in mm-hmm. terms of the, you know, the history of it. There is so much out there. And and David's grandfather is a perfect example. His name's Charlie Weaver. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for radio. So, like, that's how far back he goes. And oddly enough, played a gimmick of an old man from the hills. Uh, you know, like a hillbilly type and an old man. And he would he would kind of live in that gimmick in public the same way, you know, Borat would or Pee Wee Herman. 
Yeah. And so I think David connected with it on that level too, with the whole wrestling thing. Yeah. Um, so, and we, we talk about that stuff constantly and it is that Hollywood stuff. And I hate to, uh, I must be very weird, but they do not seem to make people like Ethel Merman anymore. Yeah. So, who only just was loud and louder. That seems to be all she ever did. Yeah. And those people are fascinating to me. Their characters and they were stars at a time where there were stars. Now yeah. there is a person with 6 million followers, yet no one knows who they are. And that's not the person's fault. That's the structure of how everything is now that everyone can film stuff and everyone has, you know, access to the same platforms that any celebrity would. So the celebrity gets smaller and smaller. So I enjoy those old people. They were also very weird. They were, um, oh, they were very weird. <laughs> they were incredibly weird. So, and I think about Ethel Merman a lot. It was her birthday a couple of days ago. And if anything, I mentioned Ethel Merman too much. It, <laughs> Ethel it, Merman and Don Knotts are like the top two on my reference list. It is um, quite incredible how many times you do mention Ethel Merman, but I like that, like, you're interested in that and like that's what because I always you know thought it, if I had, had any attention on me I would just in the middle of it be like hey kids let me just tell you about John Barrymore for a second and yes. just try and like promote that as like a you know just be like personal promotion of him but I feel like yeah Hollywood stars in that day it was different it was like it was almost like because we didn't have Twitter and we didn't get to know like the real person behind it they were just living like whatever gimmick yes they find themselves in but then yet it's even more crazy now to be able to find that information about them and her whatever it was week-long marriage to Ernest Borgnine mm -hmm. and how they didn't like each other and like that stuff is fascinating to me to be able and I've made enough inroads now that I can find out the old Hollywood dirt on people mm -hmm. and like what life was like then and it is it is the best. I, it's my favorite thing to do. It's crazy. Like when people, you know, think of, I mean, people think that like someone like, like Motley Crue are really rock and roll. And I'm like, read and read about what was happening in the yes. 1920s and 30s with drugs and sex. Yeah, read about the people who are casually sipping morphine at a <laughs> cocktail party. I think those would be the significant people. <laughs> Have you, um, because you live in LA, right? Have you done like Hollywood cemetery tours and, and stuff? I've not done Hollywood cemetery tours. I'm on, I have a, this is even, even stranger list. So mm -hmm. December, I went to Morgantown, West Virginia, which was the hometown of Don Knotts. Uh -huh. They have a wonderful Don Knotts statue there. And then the next stop on my list, maybe it's in Carlsbad, California. It's the Lawrence Welk Museum. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with Lawrence Welk. He no. was like a, a band leader and he okay. had like a, he had a show where they played all this weird music, but he was a weird person. And then also, I believe Albany, Albany, New York is the hometown of Rod Serling and mm -hmm. they have a Twilight Zone carousel there. So I have a bunch of weird things uh, on my list. I had also, there was a rumor that my grandmother was friends with Dom DeLuise's sister mm -hmm. and we're still researching that. The jury is still out. So that would, be, that would make a good uh, like road trip documentary. Yes. Yes. That no one would watch, but I would enjoy. <laughs> well, I also wanted to ask you about your kind of friendship with Dan Housen. Like how did how did you guys meet and decide that you had this amazing uh, on screen chemistry? It's very like waiting for Godot of just like two guys, you know, waiting for a bus is yeah. kind of how we knew each other. I had wrestled him pre Danhausen, where I don't think any of that was realized yet. And he was just a guy, a nice guy, but, and then I think my understanding is that old wrestling, mm -hmm. which is a place that, that I think he wrestled at first, I think allowed him to find himself and be weird. And then you stumble upon stuff and I think we were just at a show and I had known him a little bit and he said, do you want to do my YouTube thing? And they said, sure. Do you want to do mine? And 
we did it and we we did mine and it's one of those things that maybe we didn't realize that it was that good <laughs> while we were doing it and then i put a clip of it online and like boom, like a bunch of people liked it and we went oh okay there is something here it's sometimes only when you look back on something do you find that and then we kept doing stuff together and, and people liked us together for some ungodly reason. And then of course, you know, he gets to AW, which incredibly proud of him because he, you know, cracks, cracks the mold in terms of breaking beyond wrestling, you know, and he does it in such his own way. It's not like, Oh, I'm going to go through wrestling to make it to Hollywood. It was like, no, I'm going to crack the code on my own, which he totally did in terms of, having a shirt at Hot Topic and having people, you know, resonate with him that aren't wrestling fans. And now we sold more merch in AW than anyone, which mm -hmm. is insane. So he's crazy. not in the main event every night. He's not, you know, he's just amassed this cult. I guess it's more than a cult now. It just, it's cult-ish because he's so ghoulish following. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was so proud of him. And then I got there and I was like, oh my God, this is weird. And we both look at each other like, all right. And then, you know, he's my first guest on AW naturally. Yeah. And since then it's this, it feels like an old sitcom where the main character will run into that annoying character, you know, working in different jobs, no matter where the person goes, he'll go to the florist or he'll go to the doctor's office. And that person is always there. So I guess we are destined to do this forever in a way. Having then uh, known him a bit before, like when you saw him again as Dan Heisen, were you like, what What the hell happened to you? Or like, did you see that, no. like that in him? No, I, I, I think I, it's definitely, you know, it came from him. It was definitely stuff that I think he was interested in. And <laughs> sometimes you don't know how to put the pieces together, but other times, you know, you're just listening to other people at first and you want to do what you're told is what you should do and how to make it in this business. And a lot of times that does not work, yeah. nor does it make you happy because it's not coming from yourself. Um, so not only am I not enjoying myself, I am now a failure. So it's very frustrating. And then you go, okay, fuck these people enough. And you start doing your own shit. And at first, it's incredibly confusing. People don't understand. And you're undeterred. You have to be like, no, this is me and I'm sticking with it. And then people come around. I got, you know, a lot of confusion singing Ethel Merman on indie shows. People would I don't get it. And it's like, okay. And then you just, I don't really care. Once you say, I don't care, and it is very selfish. But once you say, I'm going to do what I find entertaining. And if anyone else wants to join me, that would be great. Then it opens up this, this, the world. And then it gains traction and it's something you like. So it's the best of both worlds, you know? And then you end up being like the foremost expert on the things you do. Yeah. Which is, which is everything you want. And I'm, you know, Dan Housen's journey from the Indies, as was mine, was pretty long and middling where you're trying to figure stuff out. And yet, ultimately, it is worth it. Mm -hmm. Not that, don't get me wrong, if you want to quit the business, you know, leave. Get a good job, start a nice family, and you can be a good person. That's probably more admirable. But if you can't stop, then please continue. Uh, Danhausen's success, it, it really is, like, pretty mind-blowing. And he was just in, I think it was New York Times, like, profile? Yes. And I was erroneously referred to as fellow AEW wrestler. <laughs> So I don't know how much research they did for it, but it's a nice article. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, like, thinking about Dan Housen's success and you both do something, like, very different in wrestling, like, do you ever have, like, do you think about how wrestling can break through into the mainstream again um, in an Attitude Era-esque way? And is that something you think about? Like, like what could we be doing, guys? Like, as well... And now, if I may get philosophical on you, mm -hmm. uh, comparing the world now to the Attitude Era time, mainstream does not exist the same way it did anymore. Yeah. 
there is no mainstream in the sense that I was talking about how there's Ethel Merman was like a big star. You do not have the level of stardom anymore. That system doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are holdouts like maybe a Brad Pitt and a George Clooney in terms of like those old A-list whatever. Mm -hmm. But now you have, oh, this person sold 10 million albums. And again, nobody knows who they are. So it's not like the Beatles or Elvis where everyone knew who they were, right? Yeah. So at first you have to reconcile that where we can't go back 30 years and, and go for that same, same success. Having said that, um, there's definitely ways we can reach different people. And I always, you know, if you want to grow this business, you have to make fans out of people that weren't fans before. You can't just entertain the same people who've been watching this for 50 years. Like that's mm -hmm. insane. We need to grow the business. Best way to do that is to, you know, there's a certain amount of wrestling content that goes a certain way that attracts a large number of people. And then I'm allowed to do stuff. And so is Dan Housen. That's different. And it attracts different people. I hear it all the time. My wife hates wrestling. She loves AEW. Mm -hmm. And also I, people have said, your show is a really good gateway to get into AEW and to get into these people, mm -hmm. to learn their stuff and go, oh, this Eddie Kingston guy seems re really interesting. Now I want to see him fight. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think, and it's, it's a lot of experiment and I'm sure there's a lot of failure that comes with it too. And I don't necessarily think it needs to be, you know, that seems to be that mainstream, like, oh, I want to do main events and then I want to be in a DC movie. And it's like, there's a million other things we could do too. You know, there's no predictor for success anymore. Mm -hmm. There's not. Some of the weirdest stuff I've done, somebody just retweeted from like five years ago, I wrote lyrics to the night court theme and <laughs> someone just retweeted it again. And they're like, this deserves a bump. So you never know. So you just got to experiment. And luckily, Dan Housen and I are afforded that freedom because ultimately, mm -hmm. I think Tony understands that. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, that is how AW's, able to reach a very wide weird audience where you got rick ross and then you also have ken jong on the show and then maybe bow wow yeah uh so and which i think is great which actually does feel like those old variety shows you know that old kind of ethel mermany you know oh alice cooper and gene wilder like <laughs> that that weird mix so i'm sure elements of that can come back but Yes. Look, we're trying to figure it out. That's all I can say. I think I'd like to get back to the days of like seeing a wrestler host like SNL or something. I'd love to AEW like collab of, of, of talent, like just doing that, I think. Yes. And that, I, I mean, even SNL has changed in terms yeah. of, you know, and that's, but it's totally possible. There are people there who will also incredibly talented comedically and maybe you don't get to see it uh on dynamite or rampage i mean sometimes you certainly do but the thing i did with ricky starks in the car and he's just fantastic stuff i did with billy gunn and paul white is so funny mm -hmm. i like he is so funny yeah. on his own and does stuff so uh beautifully that I'm happy to at least provide a small platform for people to exercise those muscles because they certainly have them. Who for you is the most unexpectedly funny wrestler just as themselves that you wouldn't think? Hmm. I, I'm thinking of people that I just know are really, really funny. Um, like I always hear that to think Suzuki's really funny and Toriano is really not. It's, it's what people are going to Japan He's tell. very sage. He's very boring. He's incredibly <laughs> dull. Um, who is really, really funny. This is a wonderful... Well, Jim Ross was just incredibly... He's what certain people are like beyond funny. Yeah. Where I will look back now and go, I see now that that was a joke. Yeah. Because he was, I, he was operating on a level of dryness <laughs> that I was not accustomed to. I always go back to that Arn Anderson episode. Yeah. Um, because I feel like, you know, how funny Taz can be. Yeah. Uh, but Arn Anderson, I was just 
blown away by with how weird like i was not i don't go in expecting too much out of people i assume people are gonna be bored and they don't want to do it and he sat down and he was just perfect chris statlander is funny and in a very unusual way did you i think i bring him a quarter yes okay (laughs) uh she she was playing it she had learned to play the recorder Mm -hmm. and i thought you know that may be a good idea and so she yeah she brought it i think she already had it or she was already working with it and i was like well we need to use it Mm -hmm. uh ftr is very 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 funny um adam cole seems to also be very funny yeah um you know in in certain ways that you don't realize until you get certain things out of them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they don't have the chance to be annoyed by an idiot as much uh, unless they're on my show. So those are the people I think that Jungle Boy is very funny. Yeah. I'm thinking of someone who like you might not think and they're usually very quiet. And then like when he says stuff, he's incredibly funny. Is Hook funny? Yes, Hook is very funny. Like, I mean, they're not funny in the same way that, you know, they're not like riffing off one-liners. Yeah. He definitely has a tremendous sense of humor. Um, In terms of the idiots he's dealt with, namely me and then Danhausen. (laughs) You know, there's got to be something amiss with him. I'd love to see Hook just walking around, like giving out wisecracks to people. (laughs) Yeah, no, he doesn't tap dance or anything. (laughs) Oh, uh, maybe he does. Maybe he does in his private time. Who am I to judge? If he wants to do a sh- soft show, he can knock himself out. But to my knowledge, no. Um, so as I, as I wrap up, I want to just go right back to the beginning. Uh, not of your life, but of uh, when, did, when did you start watching, watching wrestling? When did that happen for you? I don't remember not watching it. Sam. And it was this and the Moppet Show, which was a gateway to Ethel Merman. And, and Milton Berle and people like that. Because they, uh, the Muppet Show at that time had old, very old celebrities on who were past their primes then. And I'd watch it going, who are these wonderful people? And yeah, I just don't remember wrestling not being around. I don't remember it ever being something I did want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my parents were very supportive and open to me in the sense that they probably thought, let's indulge him now and he'll grow out of it later. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, every kid wants to be a wrestler or a Muppet, the same mm-hmm. way they want to be a Power Ranger or a fire truck. But, yeah. you know, usually by the time you're 14, 15, you go, it's probably not going to work or it's just not realistic. And I, I do not have that part of my brain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who were you like imitating as a kid or? Oh my God. Um, Roddy Piper. Yeah. Who's very big and continues to be big. And uh, I was lucky, I did a pilot with him and I did a movie with him. So we spent a lot of time together, which was very like, oof, was was very like, oh my God, the ghost of Babe Ruth is here to pass down this knowledge. Mm-hmm. And that, that was just like, just blew my mind. It was one of the craziest. And there are people like that. I was talking about the long journey of the indies and wanting to quit and whatever. There are people like that, obviously that's a huge example, who sits down with you, looks at your stuff and helps you continue doing what you're doing. Yeah. And there are other people like Sanjay who I did not know him at all. Uh, I guess maybe he was in Impact and I was on the Indies. He sent me a message out of the blue and he's like, you know, somebody showed me a promo and I love what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And you're like, wow, that probably kept me going, you know, for another couple of months. And I, you know, they don't realize it. Sanjay's just being good and supportive and whatever. But like stuff like that was so helpful to me. Um, Roddy Piper, Bobby Heenan, and which obvi- like obviously, like looking back, you go, well, this makes so much sense. And he was a person who, same with Roddy Piper, oh, you can be funny and still a great wrestler and th- at the same time and still perform all your duties. Sometimes wrestling wrestlers and people in the business get into this you can either be you know this funny doesn't draw money business or you can either be funny or you can make it and be and it's like are you out of your mind this whole business is ridiculous like i I have always said the ropes are bouncy so you know we're here this entire thing is is ridiculous 
And the, the magic of it is that we're able to present it in a way that makes you feel like it's not, mm -hmm. you know? So, so yeah, th those are the two people that always come to mind. So when you yourself decided you were going to be a, a wrestler and get into that, like, was it always the plan to be funny and like put comedy into that or? No, no. Although, I mean, you know, you, you want to be creative and you want to always want to be a good promo. Like that was very important to me. And I also had the, the instincts of what I wanted to do, but then merging the two worlds of like, well, I love Ethel Merman. I love wrestling. Mm -hmm. What happens when this happens? And then it just gave me something that no one was, was doing at the time. So I went, okay, great. And then beyond that, it was only when you get to that point, when you start failing enough and you've listened to enough people that not, weren't necessarily helpful, that yeah. you develop your own opinions and criticisms. And I started looking around at the wrestling business going, what is this? And when I started bringing that out into, I don't even want to say my character because they're, you know, my friend says about me, the, the, the trick about me is that everyone thinks it's an act. Yeah. So if I get on the mic at an indie show and complain about the lighting, you're like, ah, this guy is just whatever. But then you also look around and you go, yeah, the lighting is bad here. So when I got, I got really bored and I thought I have to keep myself entertained and I want to do stuff that I don't feel like I've seen before. Mm -hmm. Whatever the consequences are, whatever. Uh, some people got it, some people don't. But when I got into that, that made me feel like there was a bigger home. Like, I feel like there was a home for my humor, but it wasn't necessarily there yet. Yeah. And the fact that I've been able to do stuff that people in wrestling have not done before in terms of like a comedic talk show of that nature, I think, I think shows that is that I had to kind of make a little room for myself. Yeah. You know? And finally, you like sitcoms. So I wanted to ask, what did you think? What do you think about Frasier being rebooted? And do you think that him and Lilith should end up together eventually in their old age? Well, I um, am a big fan of Bibi Newarth. I, I tried to date her. It turns <laughs> out she's married, so that didn't go very far, but I, I tried. When did, and... you, when did you try as a... Pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. I went through a rash of, I had enough contacts that I thought maybe her or Ellen Green from the Little Horrors would be a good match. They never panned out. I would have, I would let you know, I would break it here if I was dating either of them. And I don't know how I feel about it. I'm the, the night court reboot makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, and I was going to say, all the main cast is there. And then I just realized uh, John Mahoney, the father's dead. Yeah. So that, so now we have to have a sad scene where they look at an empty chair and then throw it at, like, yeah. I don't know. Like, this is a lot. Mm -hmm. Where were you when the guy was alive and looking for work? Yeah. Um, but I think I, I always enjoyed that show. I enjoy B.B. Newirth. And I think Kelsey Grammer is ready to shake off the stink of money plane and get back to work. And of course, uh, David Hyde Pierce. So there's all these good people, but I don't know if I want to see it. I think I want to see it. And I think that's enough to make people make the show, right? The same way Night Court, you go, ooh, and then you hear the new theme song, and you go, where's the bass? So I'm looking, no, I'm not looking forward to it. Again, with these reboots, I've learned to go in with zero expectations. Yeah. Because some of them are okay and worth it, although none are coming to mind right now. The Mad About You one, which I love Mad About You, was like, just okay. Yeah. You know, there hasn't been too many of them where I went, wow, that was really worth coming back for, guys. Like, the Sit by the Bell one was bizarre. That's the most bizarre, like... But I think and also the realization is that... and. I'm sorry if I upset you. Saved by the Bell was always shit. <laughs> it was. So to look back on something really, really shitty and then they're making fun of it being shitty. It's like, yeah, that was you guys. And it's still shitty. You can't just yeah. wink yourself away from this. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so that one was very difficult. There are, you just got to do something else with it. Like when you go back and do the exact same stuff, it's weird. 
-hmm. And then if you do something in a totally different direction, it bothers people too. So maybe stop rebooting things. It's not going to, you know, whatever. People are going to reboot things constantly and that's fine. But I won't get my hopes up about them. Favorite um, baby Neworth role in case she's watching and would we can reconsider. I think of her in, she has a really small role in Say Anything that John Mahoney's in as well. Yes. She looks really good there as the, the teacher that comes to the party. Yes, she did. I think my, my favorite role is her in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And they did a wonderful uh, performance of all that jazz on Letterman. I think is on YouTube and that's really good because she's a, a person and same with David Hyde Pierce, like they are theater actors and you get yeah. that same with like a B Arthur, you get that level of like quality acting underneath all their roles and they're very mm. good. She's very good on, on cheers. Yeah. She's real. Like they're just, they're, they're bursting with talent, but I would, I would go back for my own, you know, sexual deviancies. I would go back to her her role in Chicago. Well, thank you so much, RJ. Oh, it was so awesome to talk to you and cover a, such a range of topics there. A smorgasbord. Of a smorgasbord. <laughs> yes, well done, well spread out. <laughs>